Good evening and welcome to tonight's virtual program. I'm Em, I'm one of the librarians here at Rockin' Public Library, and we're thrilled to be hosting tonight's author talk. Uh, I want to start off the, tonight with a couple quick programming notes on upcoming virtual events this month at the library. Uh, next week on March 18th, Meg Rasmussen, the executive director of the George's River Land Trust, will be talking about canoeing the St. George's River. Um, and the following week on March 25th, Lisa Millette will be offering a presentation on seed saving and how the science of seed genetics is linked to your home garden. Um, and now I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's speaker. Michael Hillard is professor of economics at the University of Southern Maine. He has published widely in the fields of labor relations, labor and working class history, and the political economy of labor and capitalism. Dr. Hillard regularly provides expert testimony in Maine on macroeconomics and employment issues affecting working people. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Michael. Go right ahead. Great. Um... Nice to meet all of you tonight. I look forward to speaking to you after my presentation. Um, I'm going to get my PowerPoint up here in a second. Uh, but let me just say some things as way of uh, background. Um, so before I go into talk about my book called, uh, um, sorry, let's see, try and fix that. Um, I'll start from there. Um, before I get to talk about my book, uh, Shredding Paper, The Rise and Fall of Maine's Minor Paper Industry, um, I think it's probably a little bit, it's going to be helpful to uh, the group uh, to get a little bit of context about who I am and how I came to write this book. Um, I'm an academic. I've always been fascinated and I teach on topics that have to do with uh, U.S. economic and labor history. Uh, I came to Maine uh, to teach at USM in 1986, and it was in the middle of a time where there were these massive dramatic strikes going on in the paper industry. Um, and it started uh, my interest in it. And in fact, over the years, um, I had the experience of teaching uh, at USM, a lot of students who worked at the local paper mill, um, historically known as S.D. Warren, uh, and uh, they were in the process of knowing that they were gonna be losing their jobs, so they were getting business degrees at USM. Uh, so I got further intrigued and starting in 2000, um, I started a journey that took me about 15 years to do the research um, to tell the story of the main paper industry. And as I kind of got into it, one of the things that um, I learned about most is that, you know, this was the biggest industry in the history of the state. And again, 1980s and 1990s, uh, dramatic time of big strikes. Um, uh, and uh, of the uh, beginning of the end for much of the industry as uh, mills started to downsize rapidly. Um, and when I went and looked at it, um, with, with a few important exceptions, there was very little written about the history of the industry, especially with a focus on Maine. Um, and in the end, as an academic, and you'll see I'll make some reference to some big concepts uh, that um, academics use um, to understand some of the topics we're looking at. I mainly just wanted to tell the story for a general audience of this remarkable industry and of the people who worked in it, uh, the things that were made, uh, the way it transformed the landscape, um, the way it interacted with our politics, uh, and ultimately fitting the story of the decline in the industry into a larger uh, national global story. Um, uh, my main tool for finding out about um, all of this, uh, I did obviously lots of archival uh, and secondary research, but I interviewed over 150 people. Um, I learned how to do oral history interviews, and in fact, I used them in uh, two cases to develop um, uh, podcasts, and I'll be um, playing some excerpts from one of them today. Um, so I went in a lot of different directions with this, but about five years ago, I said, okay, it's time to get a book together, and I uh, worked over several years to put this uh, manuscript together, um, and it's been out for about three months, and the feedback I've been getting uh, so far has been favorable. Um, you know, the thing as an author, especially as an academic, you fear is that you're going to write a book that either nobody's interested in or uh, people have a hard time uh, with your writing style, and uh, so far the early returns are that um, I don't have a problem in either of those areas. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through probably uh, about a third two thirds of our time, maybe 40 minutes, uh, and mainly talk about the rise of the industry because uh, uh, to me, it's like just a great kind of detailed piece of economic history where 
Um, you know, my general line is that Maine was the Detroit of paper, just nobody knows that. Um, you know, certainly nobody nationally, but I think a lot of people in Maine didn't realize just how prominent Maine was uh, as a paper, as a center for the paper industry. So it's a very interesting story. And then in the end, I'm going to sketch the labor history story that, that fills the last two thirds of the book. Um, people can ask questions about that. And that sort of like will be kind of a tease for the if you um, get get around to reading the book, because the book is two thirds a story of how uh, labor relations uh, evolved uh, over the last 50 years or so. Um, so with that, um, and so uh, this is my very first book talk. Um, so you guys are at the front of the line. Um, uh, so a certain amount of history, at least for me, is being made tonight. Um, and uh, so this is the first time I'm trying to do a big story and uh, using PowerPoint to do it. So. Hope you will find this valuable. Um, so you can see below there, I say that uh, my book is a history of capitalism, labor, and labor relations. And that really refers to the fields uh, that I'm drawing on that have very well-defined stories. And I will talk a little bit about how labor historians think uh, about the last hundred years and about how economic historians think about um, the time period when uh, the paper industry grew and then what's happened more recently. Um, so that's sort of the background or the framework. Um, okay, now I will go to the full on uh, use. All right. So um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm fitting the, the story of the main paper industry. Sorry about that. That's only going to happen, I think, on this slide. Um, as it played out in Maine's paper industry, as I said, Maine, I think, became the, the Detroit of paper. Um, and then uh, in telling the story of the industry's decline, um, uh, uh, looking at the way in which people have responded to, um, you know, a, a really tough story after a, a storied um, um, era of success. So um, I bet there's some people in the audience who may have some connection to the Bucksport Mill, which I'll mention a few times uh, tonight. Uh, but many people don't know what a paper mill is. I'm going to start with one of my favorite uh, fellow travelers in telling the story of the paper industry, Monica Wood. Um, and there it is. Here's a quote from uh, her book, We Were the Kennedys. Uh, the mill, the rumbling, hard breathing monster, made steam and noise and grit and stench and dreams and livelihoods and paper. It possessed a scoured industrial beauty as awesome and ever changing as the leaf plumped hills that surrounded us. It made a world unto itself overbearing and irrefutable. And so here, what I love about her quote, other than her really excellent, vivid uh, imagery, um, is to just give a sense that, you know, the paper mill is just this thing that just like Ford's, you know, first assembly line, it's a major piece of our history. Um, and uh, uh, in and around it was built a whole way of life um, that was very much about uh, nature and machinery and uh, work lives that were very difficult uh, and very powerful. Um, a lot of my focus tonight will be on the story that I tell most closely in the book, which is of S.D. Warren. Uh, uh, I learned a lot about S.D. Warren because it's three miles from my office here in USM. I wound up going as far as Madawaska over my years to do research, but um, this is where I started. Uh, and in the mid-1880s, here's a picture uh, of the mill on the Presumpscot River, again, just a few miles outside of Portland. Um, and most mills in the, well, all the mills in the state are on rivers for reasons that I'll explain. Um, and often they're over the rivers. And so uh, when I first started doing oral history interviews, they would talk about one side of the, the river versus the other side of the river to locate yourself within the paper mill. Uh, paper mills are, of course, are about trees. Um, and I found this postcard of the woodlot um, at Great Northern Paper around 1950. And you can see um, and you know, what it says there is uh, in, in the details is that this is a million logs. Um, and the reason why the industry was built in Maine is because of the trees that we have. Uh, and it gives you a sense of the amount of raw materials that go into uh, making, making paper. Um, another postcard from the mid 1900s. This is Oxford paper in Rumsford, um, which you'll see another picture of at more recent times in a minute. Uh, so there's Oxford paper on the left around 2010 under different owners. Uh, and on right, the uh, very famous uh, Great Northern Paper Mill um, circa 2000, which is sort of near the end of its historical run. Uh, and there's a Bucksport Mill that was originally Maine Seaboard, built in Bucksport because 
uh, Central Maine Power is building a big hydroelectric dam and they needed uh, to figure out a customer uh, for all their electricity. Um, and so they decided to build a paper mill because paper mills use tremendous amounts of energy and resources. And I mentioned there uh, the many different companies that have purchased uh, that mill before it was uh, finally uh, closed down and torn down a couple of years ago. And that is a big part of the story I tell is that the industry emerged uh, for almost 100 years with a very kind of local, stable generation to the next kind of uh, ownership that uh, said a lot for the culture of these companies. And then uh, starting around 1960, that era came to an end in this kind of turnstile of different owners uh, from away with all kinds of uh, uh, consequences. Um, uh, I like this picture of Fraser Paper Mill. If you can see um, up top uh, is the, where those smokestacks are. Those are the, that's the big pulp mill, which is actually in Edmonton, Canada. And uh, these bridges here have big conduits in which they pipe the um, pulp made on one side of the river and in one country over to the American side in Madawaska. Um, and we'll be talking more about this mill later in the presentation. Um, Okay, so um, just to sketch the book then, uh, the first two chapters uh, tell the story of the rise of the Maine paper industry and how uh, the mass production paper revolution came to Maine. So when I say mass production revolution, that has a very important significance in economic history. The United States is famous for taking the British Industrial Revolution, often called the First Industrial Revolution, and taking it one step further um, because we had much bigger markets uh, because uh, we had uh, better machine making skills and uh, uh, the combination of those, those factors led us to build uh, a mass production industry in the United States that people generally associate with Ford, but paper is probably one of the top dozen or so mass production industries in the country. Uh, and that emerged in the late 19th, early 20th century, which is when the paper industry kind of uh, turned into the, the modern uh, marvel that it is. Um, so, um, and then uh, the next part I'll go uh, that I'll talk about is uh, what I call the paradoxes of paper mill employment. Um, uh, in the book, I, I think I use the title Paradox of Suffering and Success uh, because mill work uh, in paper mills is extremely hard. In fact, very dangerous uh, in many cases, difficult. I'll, I'll kind of sketch all the reasons why, but. Also kind of uh, a, a remarkable story of industrial skill um, that is not typical of some other industries that you would think of as more assembly line industries uh, and the role of paternalistic management that kind of came out of that. Uh, so why did the paper industry come to Maine? Um, uh, I call that in my book, a rags to riches story and you'll understand that in a moment. So there are sort of four dramatic actors in this story. Uh, the rise of national large markets uh, being one, and specifically a, a mass market for paper uh, that was expanding ge geometrically, I think, from uh, like the 1870s on. Technology, uh, uh, very important revolution technology happens around the 1870s, which is true of many industries. It's like the invention of mass production steel happens around 1870, and something similar happens with paper. Uh, raw materials, um, you know, basically why Maine? We had the raw materials and you're probably aware of that, but I'll say a little bit more about that as I go along. Um, and geography, um, which is that uh, Maine had, had all of the right kind of attributes to attract this industry. So let me start with markets. Um, uh, probably something you're aware of, but still it's just really remarkable that from the uh, time of the um, constitution in 1787, every generation our population doubled. Um, so by the time we get to the early 20th century, we had over 100 million uh, Americans. Um, let me go back to that. And uh, it's worth noting at that time that Great Britain had a population of 40 million at that time. And that was the second biggest uh, 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 manufacturing market in the, in the world at that time. Uh, literacy is important. We're a very literate country, at least white people in the 19th century, African Americans not so much because of slavery. Uh, but by the 1940s, you have uh, almost all whites being literate um, and African Americans um, catching up quite a bit there as well. Um, and what did that mean? Well, we didn't have television before 1950. Uh, and we didn't have that many magazines before uh, 1900. Um, so you can see 
the rapid growth of uh, magazine reading households, um, you know, a factor about 50. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and so by 1947, we were sending out basically weekly almost 400 million magazines. Um, uh, it's important to think of the paper industry as being very similar to the chemical industry because, in fact, it is a chemical industry and chemistry is at the heart of production. Um, it's very similar economically to DuPont um, because DuPont sort of paved the way for a, a a certain way of uh, kind of uh, manufacturing magic, which is that if you have expertise to, in the case of DuPont, make something like um, dynamite and gunpowder, you could hire more scientists and engineers and start designing other products like cellophane, plastic, um, synthetic fibers, uh, rayon, nylon, things like that. Um, that's what DuPont was doing in the 20s and 30s. And the same thing was happening in the paper industry because they started with basically making newsprint and book paper and then expanded to constantly invent a lot of products. Uh, and, and one of the things that's cool about Maine is that the paper mills by the 1920s and 30s had their own MIT scientist staffed uh, research and development labs um, that work closely with the factories. Um, so the same capital equipment therefore can be used to make dozens of different products in the same mill. Um, this leads to what economists call economies of scope, uh, meaning if you already have expertise in paper making and you just tweak uh, by using a different set of formulas to make a different product, um, you can get rich and it's very hard for competitors that don't already make paper uh, to do that. Uh, and what were some of the key uh, market segments? Well, newsprint was the first big one and was important in Maine, including Eastern Seaboard, uh, Maine Seaboard started um, as, as that. Uh, the heart of Maine's industry were advanced printing grades, um, coded, uh, publication, coded publication papers, um, uh, especially those you, that were used for print color magazines, um, and then a whole variety of products, wrappers, labels, uh, bags, cardboard boxes. Um, just to pick an example, um, uh, the Hollingsworth and Whitney Mill in Winslow uh, that later was purchased by Scott um, by the mid 20th century, they, um, I think they had the market nationally on butcher wrapping paper, which was a pre actually a pretty high quality paper. And they also made those old cards that some older people might remember for uh, computers, the, one, the ones that said, fold, don't fold, bend, or mutilate, and there were punch cards for doing computer programs. Uh, so just an incredible variety of products. Um, and obviously, you know, people think of uh, things like toilet paper, tissue paper, and the like as sort of like modern life, but those were invented around World War I. So that's how recently um, uh, those became. And so you can imagine like by inventing all these new products and having a huge and growing market, there was just a rapid expansion of the industry. Um, and you can see this in the per capita annual consumption of, um, uh, of paper, which uh, 1860s was about 60 pounds, 1920, 120 pounds, 1940, 254. Uh, 1975, 570 pounds. So you take uh, increasing population, increasing literacy, new products, and you can see that vast growth in uh, production. Um, and so just in the period between 1870, which is the birth of the modern paper industry in 1920, uh, production grew by a factor of 15. Um, and the industry became, you know, basically in the top dozen. I picked a couple of years where I looked it up. Um, and we were 11th, or the paper industry was 11th in ranking. So that gets us to technology and raw materials, which is the heart of the story of why the paper industry came to Maine. Um, the first was the invention of a machine to mass produce paper. Um, and what's remarkable, this uh, named after one of the inventors, uh, the Fordrinier brothers, um, it was actually invented about 1802. Um, but it took about a couple of decades to figure out how to make really powerful for drainiers. And by the mid 19th century, uh, they had sort of mastered that technology. And by about 1860, you could buy these machines in the United States. Um, and that was basically the ticket to opening a paper mill. Um, and the other big part of the story is that before the 1870s, for like a millennium, we mainly used across the globe cloth rags as the raw material because you need fibers. Paper's made out of fiber. So anything that's fiber that can be, you know, sort of pulped and cross hatched can be used to make paper. 
Um, and essentially with the, some of the statistics about population and literacy that I was showing be before, um, by the mid 19th century, paper mills all across the world were fighting with each other for rags, um, even with stories like taking, um, you know, going to Egypt and stealing the 2000 year old cloth rags off of mummies. And that's how desperate they were. Um, and so a scientific uh, research process went on on both sides of the uh, Atlantic, um, starting with German chemists, but there were some key Americans who were involved, who figured out how to try other more um, um, available raw materials, including things like hemp, um, uh, which people are often interested in, but they sort of fixed on trees and a certain kind of tree that uh, turned out Maine was particularly good at. Um, Let's see if I can get this to go. All right. So um, what are the stages of production in a paper mill? Uh, well, you bring trees, um, and I'll be talking more about how this came about, but uh, trees became the preferred uh, uh, raw material. Um, you basically um, bring in other uh, raw materials like the chemicals that you use for making pulp. Um, pulp production is a cooking of uh, chipped wood into small chips that is then broken down into the fibers in kind of a chemical soup uh, done in a very tall uh, machine called the digester. Uh, it is further mixed with all kinds of inorganic materials to provide the right furnish. Um, and again, this is where you can take the same pulp and make many different kinds of paper uh, kept uh, ready in, in beaters. And then they're sprayed onto the paper machine, the Fordrinier, that agitates the fibers, squeezes and uses heat to uh, create paper from pulp. And then it moves from what's called the wet end to the dry end. And by the end of the dry end, comes out with, um, with the finished paper. Um, in many of the main paper mills that focused on um, making publication papers. Um, super calendaring uh, is a process that um, can be used to uh, create different textures and widths, um, and then adding coating to that. Um, uh, and then finally, papers are brought to some part of the mill where they're cut, inspected, and packaged. Um, so here's a picture of an early 19th century for Drenier, and you can sort of see the pulp mat, uh, uh, pulp uh, vat on, on your left. Um, and then moving through a series of belts um, where those rollers are helping to squeeze and then dry the paper. Um, here's not a very good picture because I grabbed it from the internet, but uh, a modern Fredrinier in that blue sort of thing at the beginning is called a head box where you put the, um, the pulp into it and then it's sprayed on uh, this kind of conveyor belt thing here is actually two uh, big mesh screens that are at 90 degree angles and agitate, um, and that creates a crosshatch. Uh, then it goes through rolls that squeeze water out of the paper, and then uh, it gets uh, run through these um, steam heated uh, barrels that heat the water out of the paper, and then it may get calendared at the end, which is to pr produce a particular texture or finish. Um, okay, so we get this to go to the next one. Sorry. Uh, here's uh, my hunted around for a lot of pictures of early Fredriniers in Maine. This one really grabbed my uh, attention. It's a Fredrinier from uh, Great Northern Paper in 1910. And you can see uh, it's about uh, 25 feet wide. And so it was the world's biggest um, Fredrinier in 1910. Um, and uh, uh, Great Northern Paper was uh, the first really massive, truly massive plant in, in Maine making paper. Um, here's a modern uh, uh, 21st paper machine. So uh, a paper machine in 1910 might have made 100 to 200 miles worth of paper, right? You know, in terms of length of paper in an eight hour shift. Um, and, uh, you know, by 1970, that might have taken a, you could, a roll of paper could be unfolded from Boston down to Virginia. And these days it's even much larger. That's actually a Chinese uh, paper machine there. Uh, and it's remarkable. They make like 6 million tons of paper a year. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, there was a dedicated paper industry, paper industry that was in place by the 1860s. It was expensive, but many investors, um, but any investors could buy it. Um, so you could start a paper mill if you had capital. Uh, the next strength constraint was um, going from rags to um, trying to find ultimately tree resources. And the decades of research led to three processes 
uh, using tree. Ultimately, spruce fir was the uh, preferred one. So the very first one was groundwood pulp, uh, which was very rudimentary. It was basically just grinding, uh, grinding trees and treating it with water and some light chemicals, and you can make newsprint out of it. And that was about it. Uh, soda pulp uh, was uh, was a better um, using some chemicals and mixing trees and rags. Uh, but the real uh, success was the sulfide method uh, that was perfected around 1880, uh, you know, using, um, uh, you know, chloride, um, chlorine and sulfide um, to cook the fibers um, uh, make with other materials. Um, so because of the quality and resilience, it became the main method. And the question is, where do we build paper mills? So at that point, what you had is most paper mills in the United States were close to city. So you would find them, for example, outside of Boston, um, outside of uh, uh, Providence, outside of Philadelphia, most of those places um, having rivers um, that feed into those cities um, because that's where the rags were. But when they shifted from rags to wood, initially they were actually cutting trees in Maine and shipping them by ship um, down to um, uh, those urban areas. But finally, after an 1880, there was a recognition that you needed large supplies of spruce fir and rivers with the potential for dams. And there was one place to do that, and that was Maine. All right. And so water was used for three purposes, power, steam, making pulp, um, and um, actually one more, and that was to move the wood from the woods um, to, uh, to the mills. So Maine had the best resources in the U.S. with the possible exception of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin and Maine were actually the two Detroits of paper emerging in the late 19th century. Uh, most of our uh, land is covered with trees and over half of them are spruce and very crucial is we had seven major, seven major river systems. Um, and then of course, proximity to um, local markets. Um, I'm gonna show a couple of crude graphs here just because they kind of give you a sense. I mean, you're familiar with a lot of this, but um, it just gives more context to the industry. So the first thing, I just like this picture because it just reminds you that Maine is the size of the rest of New England. So it gives you a sense of the massive, like there was no other place as big as Maine at the time that had those kinds of resources. Um, and this kind of paints a picture of, you know, a, a basic rule of thumb in, in uh, Maine is that where the trees are, there are no people. Well, the people are, there's far fewer trees. Um, and where the two meet is where you find most of our paper mills. Um, so this picture on the left is just, you know, shows uh, the dark green is private commercial land. Um, and you can see basically the northern half in the eastern part of the state. Um, the right one is a population density. So where the forests are, uh, these dark green and middle green areas are like almost nobody lives there, um, as opposed to sort of from Augusta on south. Um, you probably also aware of this being Mainers, but you know, we are, are a state of rivers and we have seven major river systems from the St. Croix um, all the way down to the Saco, um, and that created a great opportunity to build paper mills there. Um, so in sum, these are the factors that led the second industrial revolution to come to Maine in the 1880s and 1890s, and I often describe it as a gold rush. Um, before that gold rush started, there was one company that was sort of blazing the trail, and it was S.D. Warren founded uh, in Westbrook in 1840. Um, it was a substantial mill with hundreds of employees by 1860s, 1870s. Samuel Dennis Warren was like many of the founders of paper mills. They were merchants in the paper industry, um, and they were basically integrating backward into the production. They wanted to have their own sources of paper, so they actually built mills, and they also recognized it was a chance to be successful in business. Um, uh, and so by the middle 1880s, uh, Warren was briefly the largest paper mill when it had uh, 900 workers, but it was quickly eclipsed uh, by these new big mills that were being built in Maine at the time. So I call it the Big Bang from the late 1980s into the early uh, part of the 20th century. Uh, the core mills of international paper were built, um, which was our version of U.S. Steel, that is to say the paper mysteries version of U.S. Steel combine of a bunch of big paper mills, but I think Hugh Chisholm and his other investors built about 
three major mills up in the kind of J. Rumford uh, area um, uh, in the 1890s um, that became part of international paper. Uh, Great Northern Paper was the paper newspapers going to some invent investors and saying, we don't want to have to buy money from international, buy paper from international paper uh, because the prices would be too high. We would like you to found an efficient and lower cost um, newsprint mill. And so that's how Great Northern Paper, um, uh, which resume, assumed operation about 1901, uh, was built up in the Millinocket area. And then Oxford Paper in Rumford uh, was built in the 1890s, um, again, by a man named Hugh Chisholm. Um, and came to share a league nationally for many decades with S.D. Warren in print and publication papers. Um, so to build a mill in rural Maine, you would have to hire a thousand plus laborers, put them in tents, um, um, uh, and build facilities that were hundreds of thousands of square feet and to buy all that machinery. You walk into a paper mill, it's not just machines, it's pipes everywhere. It's electrical connections. It's really a, an impressive um, capital intensive environment. Um, and so the new mills uh, built in 1900 with what was really big money back then were launched with uh, upwards of a million in capital, which again, you know, would be a much larger number today. Uh, just some pictures of it. This is Rumford in the 1890s, uh, where Hugh Chisholm, uh, one of the great founders of the industry, was uh, taking advantage of the Androscoggin River there. Uh, uh, up, up, up behind there is, is a huge drop in the river where they were able to build hydroelectric dams. Um, and I keep mentioning the founders, um, you know, with corporate offices near, in nearby cities, um, the founders of these companies and their children and grandchildren and then groups of professional managers that came in and uh, and often the sons and daughters of those professional managers. He had this incredible continuity, and I would say a local flavor to these companies. I mean, they were probably best described as regional companies, but uh, but to the workers and to their communities that are considered to be local. Um, and so the executives who weren't part of the paper mill directly visited all the time. Uh, and so, for example, you know, in Rumford or in Westbrook, the companies built nice inns just for their own personnel and maybe visiting customers to come stay in with chefs and the whole bit. Um, and so just as a measure of how long term uh, those managers were, um, mill managers tend to be there for something like 15 to 20 years. Uh, they would come there, they would retire there, um, you know, they were part of the community um, and that was important for um, so I use this term Chandlerian Corporation. That's one of the academic pieces in my book um, that kind of tells the story of just, you know, again, what was the business model of paper? And it was to use its prowess technologically in making, um, you know, one or a couple of brands of paper to be able to invent others and then very, very, you know, um, dramatically expand the number of products that you could sell and therefore the industry could grow quickly. Uh, as I mentioned before, it branched out, especially in Maine, to a wide array, wide, wide array of products. And uh, also, as mentioned before, um, built uh, R&D centers at the mills by the 1920s. Um, I'm going to kind of push through this a little bit just because um, most of this I've touched on before. Uh, so let me just jump out here. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, so here, um, uh, one of the things that I talk about in the course of my book is like, when did the industry peak? Um, and the answer is probably around 1970. Um, not that it continued to make more paper because uh, the, the, the productivity of the industry continued to grow quite quickly, but you can see um, this big boost after World War II um, to sales. Um, this is publication paper. So it's a segment that main paper mills were most um, kind of invested in, and you can see, um, should we go back here? Um, oops. Sorry, folks. There we go. Um, you can see, like, basically more than tripling the amount of production. Uh, prices were strong, so sales value went up even more. So that was kind of the peak of the industry. Um, what was happening at that point that spelled kind of part of the long-term uh, demise of the industry was a, a paper mill boom in the South. Um, and, you know, basically the South uh, was not a place where we put paper mills um, until really the 1940s was the be beginning of that. 
uh, because the trees there were lousy. Um, they have a lot more, you know, what you would sort of consider to be tar-like substances in it. Uh, and a Southern, uh, you know, university chemist in 1928 began to identify a way to use those much less, um, but much cheaper, much less quality, but cheaper trees because they grew fast um, to make paper. And, um, and so basically what happened is, is that companies um, in the North, uh, you know, recognizing that they could build lower cost mills in the South started to do so. Um, and uh, almost every mill in the state, uh, most mills in the state um, became uh, companies that expanded into the South during the time period. Um, and then, you know, when you get to the mid to late 1960s, uh, most of the major companies in Maine sold out to larger paper conglomerates. An example would be um, St. Regis was a national owner at Maine Seaboard, and then, that, then an even bigger company, Champion, bought bought it um, uh, in, in the case of S.D. Warren and Scott. Uh, Scott came in and bought up the S.D. Warren company. So again, these companies were being merged into national companies that didn't necessarily have the interests of Maine uh, mills at heart. Um, so the next part of the story, and I'll just do about 10 minutes of this and then quit so we can have time, uh, is I spent a lot of time talking about what it's like to work in a paper mill. Um, and all of these things are a factor. Um, uh, it's a place that's um, brutal in many ways, and, and the focus, I would say, is on the skills. It's an amazing thing to make paper. Um, mills typically run over 360 days a year, running around the clock. Um, the work environment overall, um, to quote a millwright from Westbrook, um, is a harsh uh, environment, extremes of heat and cold, mostly heat. Um, lots of brute work, especially in the woodlot and pulp mill. So you're working with moving heavy materials, getting splinters, um, you know, breathing chemicals. You know, it's pretty intense. Um, some routinized work, like in the finishing department, where um, typically women would count and inspect paper. Um, and then the very skilled work in most processes, especially paper machines uh, and digesters. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, shift work itself was pretty brutal. Um, the typical shift uh, schedule is that workers would work seven days on, take a day off. Seven days on, uh, going from the morning to the evening shift, take two days off. Uh, seven days on in the graveyard shift and four days off. Um, and the result of that is you're spending one week a month where you're working from midnight to eight and you're working 39 Sundays a year, which has all kinds of implications for family life. Lots of danger, uh, missing limbs, um, hearing loss, lung disease, cancer, grizzly deaths. Um, in the SD Warren mill alone, I counted um, and confirmed five people who had died terrible deaths in, in that mill. Um, I'm going to play a couple minutes here of uh, just uh, workers from SD Warren talking about what it was like to work in the mill and kind of what they confronted. Uh, let's see if I can get it to the right spot there. There were nice guys. Most of them were World War II guys, and about half of them were. Try that again. It's employee loyalty. And the company needed that loyalty because working in a paper mill isn't the easiest job in the world. It's hot, boiling in the summertime, and freezing cold in the wintertime. It's loud. Most of the old timers, if they have their backs to you, they can't hear anything you're saying. It can be extremely dangerous. People have died in that mill, and nearly everyone has a story about how tough it can be. Oh, yeah, we did have, we had, oh, we had one bad one. We had a bad, we had a con conveyor on the floor, which conveyed back into a back boiler. Bert came up to me, and he says, you know what happened? He says, so-and-so got in and got his foot caught in that conveyor and he got pulled into the boiler and I said oh boy that's an awful thing to have happen that and one other thing happened they had a steam valve blow up and the man was badly burned in fact he he didn't live he he got so badly burned that he he died from it you know, my husband got bad bad down there from a shot and cold Oh, burned him. It blew out when it blew out. It blew right over and he when it did all this plastic liquor comes out and it burns when it burns it eats and when all of his back 
down the back of his legs, everything. And uh, he got into the telephone booth. Then they didn't want to stop. They come out and hosed him down. And uh, he had to go up to first aid and they took what they could and bandaged him. But he was in a gauze, like a gauze diaper. And every day they take him down the mill so they could treat it and take him back. But he never lost a day's bed. And he did heal and looked just like leather on his back. The lighting was out on the machine I was. And the there was only two people on the machines, first hand, second hand, I was second hand. My block turned and I got my two fingers uh, in the machine. I pulled the nails right off them and everything. Came out and my hand was down to my side and it was stunned. And it, like I said, it was dark. I come out and my first hand said, geez, you're bleeding. He said, grab a hold of your hand. So I put my hand up straight. And my two fingers, I looked at them, and they were peeled right down to the right down to the bones, just like a banana. The chlorine smell it was uh, it wasn't good at all for you. So I tried not to breathe too much of it. Kind of lungs. I had uh, I got bronchiasis because I worked with a lot of chemicals. And I think that had a lot to do with it because I had one, I went in and had one long operation and they took me back to work. It was a year, I was out a year and a half. I went back to work and then it happened again. So when I come back to go to work the second time, they told me, no, they have you tighten me. Of course, the chemicals that were used in the coating, the, the, the smells, the aromas, the, the just would gag you. I mean, they were terrible, terrible, terrible. And of course, they come by with the the, uh, what did they call them? The engineer would come by with a wand there and hit test all the air and say everything was fine. And then he'd go outside and throw his guts up, you know. But we had to work in it for eight hours a day. There, there were some bad times. Okay, uh, I'll stop there. And uh, in the documentary goes on. So there's a lot, quite, quite a bit more of that. Um, so I'm just going to go to a couple of slides. Um, to finish up here. Um, so let me start with this slide here. Um, this is a description of the amount of skill that was involved in making paper. And I always refer to a run of paper as like a touchy uh, souffle. Um, you can either get it just right and have a magnificent outcome and make a million dollars on a shift. And that's actually possible on a paper machine. Or it could all screw up and you could produce what they would call expensive scrap. They would take paper that either tore off the paper machine or didn't have the right attributes and they would just tear it up and throw it back into the pulp and try and start over again. Um, so this is just a, a quote about the kind of machine skill it took in which people who worked on paper machines for 20 years uh, and acquired a ton of experience and there was kind of a team of people of testers and engineers and the first hands who were trying to figure out, make a good run of paper. So here's the quote from a, a study from the mid 20th century. Because of the many variables, both in the raw materials and in the operation of the individual machines, it has been considered impossible to establish a standard specification that could produce a given quality of paper every time. The men used to say that there are uh, 287 different factors that varied in the production of any single paper. And that was kind of the heart of what I learned about paper production is that it's not like an assembly line where you can take somebody and train them to, you know, screw on the same widget on a car uh, coming down the assembly line, that it was actually much more of a, it's almost like having a bunch of chefs involved um, um, who use their experience and skill. Um, and this had implications for the type of management structure because uh, you needed to win the support of your workers, and so the mills were always generous employers from the start, um, generous both in terms of pay and compensation, but also in kind of attitude towards the workers, so there was a bond of trust between management, um, and just to kind of get to the tail end of the story then. Okay, good. So what happened? So the industry changes, the mills are not, no longer locally owned. And after really like three or four generations of labor peace, um, you get uh, uh, workers increasingly rebelling against companies that are no longer local and are asking things of them uh, that don't fit with traditional patterns and norms. Um, so I talk about the fall of Mother Warren, um, which had been a non-union company until 1967 and out of it became one of the most militant uh, uh, sets of union locals in the state. Um, 
uh, a story that I tell in a radio documentary and also in a chapter of my book, The Madawaska Rebellion, uh, was a rebellion of French power um, that sort of epitomized how um, outside owners, in this case, the managers had always been the English, um, both from Canada and the United States, because uh, Madawaska is way up north. Um, and um, so in 1967, to kind of save the company from being snapped up by a conglomerate, they brought in a bunch of managers from Great Northern Paper um, who looked down upon uh, the French workers there. And um, there was a remarkable story of a strike which ended in the townspeople, including will, women and children, uh, blocking the trains from moving paper out of the mill. So it's almost like a 19th century strike. Uh, but that happened in 1971, and actually there was a dramatic and sort of violent confrontation between the workers, their families, uh, and the state police um, that involved tear gas and rocks and things like that. And in the end, uh, um, uh, the company had to settle with the workers. Um, there was an exotic strike that happened in the Maine woods in 1975 that focused then and to this day, to a degree, on the presence of Canadian guest workers as a big part of the woods workforce and tensions around that. Um, in the 1980s, you get the full Wall Street takeover of manufacturing, uh, where Wall Street increasingly is basically these large uh, uh, investment fund managers that control pension funds. Um, embracing this new philosophy to maximize uh, shareholder value, which basically meant, if you look at the bottom there, the point I make is that corporations that paid workers were seen by Wall Street as stealing profits from shareholders. Um, so as main paper mills became absorbed into a national conglomerate, um, they were now being headed by uh, companies that um, where the CEO is facing uh, an ultimatum to raise profit margins are getting fired, and it led in turn to new hardball demands to change work practices, uh, allow for outsourcing the highest paid jobs in the mill, and cuts of wages and benefits. Um, Boise Cascade and Jay actually provoked strikes that um, uh, were meant to get the workers to go on strike so they could replace them with non-union workers. Um, and then uh, this provoked a very dramatic movement in response. Um, under Damocles' sword, um, some of the other companies decided to go in the direction of a higher road thing, of trying to reorganize the basis of work rules. Um, and uh, there were some successes in Maine, including in Winslow. Uh, but what happens at the end? Uh, in the end, these companies, uh, and I use the case study of Chainsaw and Al Dunlop taking over Scott, um, they're brought in to financially engineer these companies, which basically means um, cutting any kind of positive labor relations things that are still remaining. Um, and in the case of Scott, uh, Chainsaw L. Dunlop cut you know, almost half the jobs in the company um, and gratuitously put mills out of work um, or out of business. Um, and then the last part, and I'll end here, is just um, uh, through all the oral history interviews that I did, um, I discovered that um, uh, workers had a really fine sense of their own history. Um, and they were looking back on two eras, an era in which there was those paternalistic labor relations where uh, unions and managers were, if not friends, they had, they had really positive relationships. Uh, and many of the major mills in the state, including uh, um, the Bucksport Mill, uh, will have gone four, five, six, seven decades without a strike. And then all of a sudden, all of these strikes happen because of who came in and what they asked of their, um, uh, asked of their workers, which were things that I think were generally unreasonable. Um, and uh, in the case of Esty Warren, the workers, in fact, and, and there was a version of this in Millinocket, although it didn't get as far, where the workers were looking back on saying, well, S.D. Warren knew how to run the mill, and then these people came in and kind of ran it into the ground. Um, I bet you if we bought the mill, we could restore it to its former glory, and there was an attempt that Scott blocked uh, for those workers to buy the mill. Um, and then the lessons for the 21st century. Um, most people think that you know, there's a lot of discussion of alienated blue collar workers, um, including those in um, Maine uh, for political reasons in recent presidential elections. And so there's a lot of finger pointing that goes on to say that the reason why these uh, industries went into the ground is because of globalization. 
Um, that's an easy shorthand. You know, wages are low in China, the factories go to China. What really happened with the decline of the paper industry in the United States and, and particularly in Maine and Wisconsin was that um, the problem of globalization, I mean, on one hand, there was always competition from Canada and Scandinavia in particular, in the United States going back over 100 years. Um, the big change in globalization for the paper industry is when China entered the WTO in 2001 and got favored nation status for trade. Um, so we weren't really buying paper from China before then. Uh, but at that point, China put um, over $20 billion into its industry to develop technologies more advanced than those in the United States in the very product lines uh, that we specialized here in Maine. Um, and so to go to the top bullet there, globalization versus automation versus financialization, what I would say is that um, those are three different factors that cause the decline of manufacturing in the United States. Um, everybody thinks about globalization, everybody's aware of automation, and that was most relevant in Maine in the woods where mechanical harvesters allowed us to uh, cut the um, wood, wood cutting labor force by about 75% in the late, late 20th century. Um, but what really drove the paper, paper mills in Maine kind of down towards their demise uh, were the outcomes and the effects of financialization, which um, I try and document in my book through the interviews that I did and other sources that um, led to a mismanagement of what were very, very talented uh, workforces um, leading to a decline of product lines, competitiveness, and the end. And I probably went about 10 minutes longer than I planned to, but um, hopefully I painted a picture of what's in my book and I'm well ready to uh, have a conversation. Um, Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I see we have a couple questions in the chat already. If you have a question when no one else is speaking, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Michael a question. Or if you prefer, you can type them into the chat and I'll read them aloud. Um, this first one here, when did dioxin become part of the process and what purpose did it serve? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, of course, um, uh, you're asking me something that I have a general knowledge of and not uh, uh, this is one of the things I know a lot of the the um, technical trivia of the oh thank you very much Chris uh, I know some of the a lot of the technical trivia um, dioxin is associated with chlorine um, and it's used to um, uh, to produce paper that's white and glossy um, so I'm going to guess that it probably was in wide use by around the turn of the 20th century because that's when those type of mills with that sort of emphasis of product lines and, and technology. Um, but I'm not sure that I could date exactly when that happened. Um, can I just, Em, is it okay if I just like respond to these? Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm gonna jump around. Um, okay, so uh, when the plants electrified was at the beginning. Um, so when they built these paper mills in Maine, uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, and the first days of the 20th century, um, they built uh, dams, they built hydroelectric uh, uh, dams, but other dams as well, and sluiceways, all, you know, to be able to move that mountain of wood every spring to the mill. Um, so yeah, and, um, you know, we had communities like Rumford and Millinocket that were, where working class people had electricity before they had it anywhere else in the country. Um, so that's a really uh, fascinating part of the, the, the story of the industry. Um, moving back up, okay, David Alexander. Um, didn't outside managers have paper making knowledge to what extent did declining makers contribute to the um, uh, collapse of the paper industry in Maine? Um, let me talk about the outside managers piece. Um, and I'm just going to kind of give you like, uh, I'm going to touch on it and maybe invite you to read the book um, to get a more uh, a detailed uh, look at it. But um, I would say in a couple of different stages. So if you take the example of, uh, so I studied very closely the SD Warren company, which was independent till Scott bought it in 1967. Um, and interestingly enough, in the 1970s, because uh, the S.D. Warren company brands were so strong. You know, S.D. Warren and Oxford made the best coded publication papers in the country. Um, they decided to actually build a new mill up in uh, uh, the um, 
Skowhegan area that goes by either the name of the tall, small town that's in the Hinkley Mill or the Somerset Mill for the county. Um, so they built a new mill there and then Scott already owned um, what had been the Hollingsworth and Whitney. Um, and so Scott was basically a tissue maker and SD Warren made very different kinds of products. So um, senior managers and executives that I interviewed um, uh, along with local managers confirmed that the Scott and the SD Warren culture has never quite merged. Um, so to the degree that um, Scott was moving in uh, managers who weren't familiar with the kind of paper grades, um, they weren't always uh, attuned to the specificities of how to best run uh, these mills. Um, but that was kind of an early stage. A later stage is in the 1980s. Um, you know, there was a much quicker turnstile of people being brought in again, you know, and it's like the way those mills really work. Like I had skilled workers saying in the 1990s that, hey, you know, the people who are managing the mill now don't know how to do anything. So are, we basically run the mill. So um, and then, you know, how did this contribute to the collapse of the, the business? Well, again, using an SD Warren example. So SD Warren, um, you know, was famous, and I really write a lot about it in the book, for making like 30 different grades a week on 14 different paper machines, uh, because they have lots of different kinds of customers, and they had the skill to reorient the machines, uh, uh, you know, kind of every shift to make a different kind of paper. Um, and uh, they had a lot of standard grades um, that were very popular with publishers because publishers knew this would be good for this kind of magazine or that kind of book. Um, and then when Scott came in, they started to try and move uh, uh, the actual uh, product production to other paper mills where the workers had less experience with them, made them of poorer quality. And the result was that um, customers came to lose faith in the brands and then the brand would just go away. Um, and so I quote at length uh, in one of the later champ chapters, uh, uh, a paper maker at SD Warren who uh, later became a manager, um, you know, just said, we used to make beautiful grades of paper. Um, we sent them to other mills, they didn't know how to make them. And then we lost those grades. Um, and then when we at our local mill said, well, why don't you give us a chance to specialize them in again? And you know, they had kind of moved on because of uh, their financial imperatives. Um, transportation water, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, okay, a couple different ones. Uh, at the top, um, transportation, um, the importance of water, as I mentioned, is that the mill used them uh, for steam. Um, uh, and they used it uh, uh, in making the pulp. Um, and it was being used, obviously, uh, for hydroelectric dams. And then finally, um, and a really, really fundamental piece of it is river systems. So if you know the story of Great Northern Paper, um, their forests are in the west branch of the Penobscot. And that was an excellent river and lake system that allowed them to bring those, you know, million uh, million pounds of, uh, of trees every winter to the mill. Um, so those are different uses of water. Um, is there hope for in the developments in, uh, of Old Town and Rumford uh, with uh, uh, new Nine Dragons paper? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm a historian and not a contemporary business expert, uh, but I'll say two things about it. The first thing to know is that the industry has survived, at least, you know, a version of it has survived. Uh, but employment is down 80% in the last three decades. So when you say, um, you know, the paper industry still has a chance in Maine, it does, but it's never going to employ uh, the very large workforce that it did before. Um, so you have mills that are still around that, you know, once employed, like SD Warren employed 3,200 in, in Westbrook in 1966. Uh, and the last 15 years, it's had like 300 workers there, maybe a little less than 300. Um, the thing about Nine Dragons that's different is that they have a different business model than Wall Street investment firms. So a lot of the mills that have hung on in Maine the last 20 years have been owned by U.S. private equity companies that have a business model of, we'll buy the company for five years, invest in a particular product line that we think we can make good money for five years, and then we get out and either close the mill or sell it off after that. Nine Dragons is a longer term um, sort of thing. Okay, the questions are coming faster than I answer, but I keep trying. Uh, what era of production development produced a paper that breaks down and leads to crumbling of old books? Uh, that's beyond my expertise, so I do not know that, Joel. 
Uh, what about the legacy of water air pollution for workers and communities? Well, um, you know, one of the most oft used phrases of, of people from paper mill communities that um, I actually researched it because my editor wanted to make sure I had end notes on it. I had just heard it over and over and over again in so many different oral history um, things. But I looked it up and uh, you can find um, kind of hard records on it. So, and that phrase is the smell of money. And of course, you know, uh, paper mills are chemical factories and they're not just chemical factories, they're chemical factories that put out stuff that's dangerous and also really intolerable. I mean, the smell of a pulp mill, which is where that rotten egg smell comes from is really, really overpowering. Yes, the smell of money, Chris, exactly. And uh, so, um, you know, uh, what does that mean? It means that um, there was kind of a bargain within the industry to not question the safety and health effects. I mean, if you had the highest paid jobs, best employers in Maine, making much more money than people doing other things nearby, um, you know, pride in the products that you made and the skill that you had, um, you kind of came to terms with things that you couldn't fix anyway. Um, so the legacy is now, um, one of the things that's interesting, I think, um, you know, this Carrie Arsenal's book, um, uh, which is a memoir of disease in Rumford, Maine that just came out. Um, and I would commend anybody to it. And uh, one of the stories there is that, you know, OSHA was not willing to study whether or not there were cancer clusters around uh, main paper mills. Um, apparently, it's hard to prove a cancer cluster, but you got to try first, and it was kind of waved off. Um, so, I mean, I would say that um, people I know in the industry, including a paper mill worker who became a, a OSHA, uh, actually a couple couple OSHA inspectors, and you know, asbestos. Um, uh, that was in some cases uncovered in mills into the 1990s. Um, when I started going up and doing interviews in Madawaska, I ran across people there um, who were part of a large group, a, a lung disease support group of men in their 60s um, and not a lot of men in their 80s. Um, so yeah, there's a tremendous legacy of water and air pollution for workers in their communities. Um, and it's one of the things, you know, I mean, there's a lot to celebrate about the paper industry. And I have a uh, just as an economic historian who's been fascinated by the story, I sort of celebrate the industry. I call it the mighty main paper industry because I think it was a mighty industrial power, but those industrial powers all have undersides, whether it's a labor underside, um, but I think the environmental and health one is really quite significant, um, and I wouldn't downplay that at all. Uh, are there any people who want to ask me questions verbally? Did the uh, environmental regulations of the 70s encourage mills to move to the south? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, it's one that I didn't get to the bottom of the book, but I certainly have read about it and talked to a lot of people about it. Um, you know, the thing you have to remember is that the new uh, regulations um, that, I mean, you know, OSHA and EPA date from 1970 um, were applied you know, just as much in um, Alabama or Mississippi or Georgia as they were here. Um, so I do think that there was a general, um, you know, I, I would sort of call it kind of a paradox of evidence. You know, it's one that I didn't get to the bottom of. Um, when you write a book like this, you research for 15 years, you feel like you could go for another 15 years trying to answer all your questions. Sometimes you can't. So this is one I wouldn't say I could answer, but from lots of interviews with executives in particular um, who were in the industry and had tremendous knowledge of their own um, businesses. When you went from uh, regionally owned mills where the headquarters was somewhere between here and New York City and the one major mill for the company was in Maine, uh, by the 50s and 60s, they start to have their own southern mills, and then by the 70s, they're part of some bigger company, and they get absorbed, and you lose that local flavor. Well, that meant there were more kind of corporate MBA types in some uh, corporate headquarters in some other part of the country, and they were looking at Maine, and they were like, all right, uh, energy costs are higher here, um, and the workers are more militant in the mills up here. But they're maybe the most skilled workers too, you know. So they're weighing all those things, and it led to different kinds of decisions. And so again, um, you know, the biggest and best mill in the country built in recent decades was the mill that was built 
um, in Hinckley, Maine, uh, by the S.D. Warren Division of Scott, uh, while they were paring things down. But you know, the industry was still going strong in certain respects uh, to the end of the 1980s, and it was still making a lot of paper with fewer workers as late as 2006. 2006 was sort of the last moment um, before the industry went into uh, kind of free fall. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of my what I learned. Well, the regulations in the South were very loosely um, implemented compared to what was happening here in Maine. And I think a lot of the reasons that the regulations were in place because Muskie, Senator Muskie realized that you had to have kind of equal regulations in general uh, yes, in Maine and the South. Yep. There, there, there's always that factor. I mean, I do think of, uh, uh, I do think if you look towards, um, you know, the differences between the mills here and the mills in the South is yes, I mean, the enforcement is probably gonna be more lax there, both on labor, labor um, uh, factors as well as, um, uh, as, well as environmental. Um, you know, again, and I think, you know, executives were making different kinds of decisions and sometimes they were informed by this general sense that, hey, things go better, you know, or lower cost or whatever um, in the South. Um, uh, and, but, but there was plenty of investment in Maine Papers Mills, you know, three, well into the 1980s when all these things were supposedly a factor. But, um, you know, I know one of the things is that um, if I was to write a book that was more about what managers and executives thought, which is part of my book, but it's not the central part of it, um, you know, uh, as opposed to workers, I think the workers were saying, look, you know, we really knew how to make paper and, uh, you know, we're not being given a chance to do that anymore. It's, you know, by the level of either chain, you know, decisions to disinvest or decisions just not to do things way that, that were effective in the business. I think amongst uh, people who are executives, I mean, there are folks who were very mad at the unions for being strong in that period. Um, you know, and again, like a, a company like Great Northern Paper got from its founding in 1900 to, and it was the one company in the state that had continuous union representation from like 1910 up until the end of the company's history. Um, and the first big strike they had was in 1978, and it was a long one. And uh, so, you know, there are a lot of managers that are mad at the unions. Uh, there are a lot of folks, um, including union leaders, who are mad about environmental regulations. Um, so I think, you know, one of the interesting things about it is it can almost do oral history of the disputes about why it was declining um, and to then sort of weigh it up against the evidence. Um, I basically have my own take. Um, Chris has asked another question about the divestiture of wood woodlands, um, timberland management organizations and real estate investment trusts. So, you know, what I talk about is really the impact of financialization that sort of Wall Street takeover American manufacturing kind of from the 70s to the end of the 1990s. Um, the heart of the book goes up to about the year 2000. Um, right at that time, financialization, you know, I mean, we could have a long conversation about because I teach about this. Um, you know, Wall Street, the Wall Street business model the last 40 years have produced more problems than solutions. I'll, I'll speak very powerfully up to that point. Um, and so these endless innovations on how you can take things that used to be integrated production systems, break them apart into assets and have various investment devices own bits and pieces of it where the ways of making money off it are not so much the use of them for their purposes, but just as assets to be moved around on the financial chessboard. So, um, you know, the paper companies uh, uh, realized that they could cash in around the year 2000 by selling off. Uh, their lands to these, um, you know, basically financial entities. Um, uh, there were forms of private equity funds. Um, so was that good for the industry? Um, you know, um, I'm not an expert on what's happened in the woodlands for the last 20 years. I know that um, uh, housing booms uh, have created, you know, short run spikes in prices for, for trees and logs and stuff like that. Um, but I think, you know, from my perspective, it was sort of one more nail in the coffin in, in what had been the historic model of that industry that worked so well for so long. Uh, other verbal questions? Is that it? 
What do you think, Em? I think that seems pretty good. I, I'm so delighted that a group of people, um, I can't say came out on a cold winter night because I know you're <laughs> cozy places, but uh, join me on Zoom. Um, you know, I spent a long time working on this book, actually really 20 years from start to finish, uh, including the research. And uh, it's just really a delight to share this. I think the legacy of the main paper industry and the people who worked it um, is so great. And I feel really honored and proud that I took the time to get out there and talk to a lot of people, you know, far along in, in age who could remember back to 1950 or in some cases 1924 in one of my oral history interviews and sort of, you know, capture the last great generations that did this industry in large numbers. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm happy for anybody who wants to dig in and know a little bit more about it. So 